The guardians are the thieves. We use this phrase often, but today we witness it in reality as we delve into a massive bank heist worth $10 million. However, unlike any story we've seen before, the thieves this time are police officers. These police officers exploited their position and status in society to execute what can be called the perfect operation. They literally left behind no evidence or trace. The investigators found it impossible to catch them, no matter what they did. There wasn't a single lead. But the real twist lies in what happened after the operation. Stay tuned for the story until its very end to find out what transpired. Our story unfolds in Medford, a quaint city in Massachusetts, USA, with a population of around 60,000. It was the 1980s, a period marked by a booming economy in the city. People were actively spending, traders were reaping significant profits, and there was an abundance of financial liquidity. At the heart of this prosperous community stood the Depositors' Trust, the city's largest and most reputable bank. The citizens of Medford had immense faith in this institution, entrusting it with their most valuable possessions in its safety deposit boxes. These boxes, available for rent to customers, were a symbol of security and trust. Each customer held one key, while the bank staff kept the other, ensuring dual control and safety for items like cash, gold, jewelry, and vital documents. The bank's vault, where these boxes were stored, was a fortress in itself. Constructed with iron-reinforced concrete walls, floor, and ceiling, each 50 centimeters thick, it was an edifice designed to resist even the most determined intruders. The imposing steel doors of the vault and the inner safe, where the bank's own funds were stored, underscored the sense of invulnerability. Equipped with cutting-edge security systems, including a state-of-the-art silent alarm directly connected to both the alarm manufacturer and the police station, the vault was the epitome of modern security. However, the system had a critical blind spot. It failed to consider the possibility that the very protectors of the law could turn into perpetrators. The mastermind behind the operation was Gerald Clemente, a captain of the city police. This bank heist would become one of the largest in American history, with a haul of $10 million in cash and jewelry. This heist was not a spur-of-the-moment act, but the result of years of corruption accumulation. Gerald, one of the most corrupt police officers, had not initially intended to become corrupt. But from his first day on the job, he was paired with a senior corrupt officer named Crasher, who led a circle of corrupt officers, each covering for the others and benefiting mutually. One night, Gerald and Crasher encountered another corrupt officer stealing a lounge chair from a store. This incident revealed to Gerald the extent of corruption within the force. Crasher advised Gerald to turn a blind eye to such incidents, indicating that honesty would make him an outcast and potentially bring him trouble, as many around him were corrupt or at least complicit. Gradually, Gerald integrated himself into this circle of corrupt officers. He discovered how easy it was to steal as a police officer and how to use his position for personal gain, especially when there were people around who would cover for him. Gerald, now deeply entrenched in the ways of his corrupt colleagues, began living off his ill-gotten gains. His apartment was furnished entirely with stolen items, ranging from furniture and electronic devices to large appliances like televisions and refrigerators. Remarkably, despite his corruption, Gerald maintained a strong and respectable reputation in the community as an excellent police officer. He never arrested his corrupt police colleagues, but he was efficient in apprehending ordinary criminals, earning a reputation as one of the most accomplished officers on the force. In one notable instance, Gerald successfully captured an armed gang leader. For this act, he was awarded a Medal of Courage, one of the highest honors in the police force reserved for officers who demonstrate bravery and face real danger. This reputation and the accolades he received helped him climb the ranks, which in turn allowed him to better conceal his corrupt activities and thefts. Gerald was living a double life, a brave police officer to the public and a corrupt thief in secret. This duality extended to his personal life as well. While he was a married man with a family, 
he also had a secret mistress. His life wasn't just double at work, it was a complete duality. It was as if he were living the lives of two different people, presenting one facade to the world while hiding another reality. As time passed, Gerald became increasingly bold in his criminal endeavors. With each passing year, his thefts grew more audacious, especially as his rank within the police force rose, making him feel untouchable. It all led up to the year 1980, the year when Gerald decided to undertake his most daring heist yet, robbing the largest bank in the city. The mere thought of orchestrating an operation of this magnitude was incredibly bold. It would have been impossible for Gerald to even consider embarking on such a large-scale heist if he hadn't known he had corrupt officers around him who would assist him. His closest accomplice in this endeavor was not his former colleague Crasher, who was no longer in the picture, but a man named Tommy Doherty. Tommy was the closest to Gerald among the corrupt police officers. They had met two years prior and had carried out several operations together before planning the bank heist. One of their earliest and most significant operations took place in 1978. In an audacious move, they stole the police department's promotional examination papers. They copied these exams and then sold them to police officers seeking promotion, charging $5,000 per copy. And they didn't just sell these exams to officers in their department or city, they sold them to officers throughout the state as well. This operation not only brought them a considerable profit, but also helped their corrupt colleagues advance in rank. They even gave free copies of the exam to their close allies within their corrupt circle, ensuring that their friends too rose in ranks and gained more control within the police force. This not only made their corrupt activities and thefts easier, but also increased their boldness, power, and influence over time. By the year 1980, Gerald, and his close associate, Tommy, had decided to rob the bank. They aimed for one final operation, a retirement heist, a single strike that would secure enough loot for the rest of their lives. Tommy, who was already a customer of the bank with his own safety deposit box in the vault, had the initial task of visiting the bank like any other client. But this time, his mission was to observe and memorize every detail of the vault. The layout, the dimensions, the number of safety deposit boxes, the internal safe where the bank's money was stored, the locks types, and the door's thickness. After this reconnaissance mission, Tommy relayed all these details to Gerald, the mastermind. Gerald realized that they would need a team to breach the vault. The first person they recruited into their gang was another corrupt police officer, Joe Bangs. The fourth member was Francis O'Leary, a former gangster with extensive experience in robberies. Now their group numbered four, but Gerald, aware of the bank's sophisticated silent alarm system, knew they needed a way to disable it. Since he had no expertise in electronics, they needed a fifth member, someone skilled in this field, to help them disable the alarm system. So the fifth member of the gang was a professional thief named Bucky Bart, a criminal Gerald had previously arrested. Bucky had extensive experience with alarm systems, making him an invaluable asset to the team. So the gang now comprised five members, Gerald, the mastermind, Tommy, his close friend, Joe, the third corrupt officer, Francis, a former gangster, and Bucky, the professional thief whose main task was to disable the bank's alarm. Bucky, skilled in electronics, set out to create a device to disable the bank's alarm system. However, the device didn't work immediately. The bank's alarm system had many wires, and Bucky needed to identify the correct circuits to target. His device was designed to block the alarm signal, preventing it from reaching both the manufacturing company and the police station. But to do this, he had to connect his device to the correct circuits, which required extensive testing. They spent two months just experimenting with the wiring to ensure that the alarm signal would be effectively blocked. After each trial, they had to meticulously restore everything to its original state to avoid arousing suspicion. The alarm system had to appear untouched so that employees or technicians wouldn't notice any discrepancies, which would trigger an immediate emergency response. 
Their status as police officers was the perfect cover for these trials. While Bucky worked on the bank's alarm system, their police car would patrol the area. This made it easy to deter anyone who approached, especially other officers, without raising any suspicion. The fact that they were police officers dressed in uniform and driving a police car provided the ideal cover for their operation. After two months of trial, the gang finally found the right wire and the right method to block the alarm signal, successfully overcoming their first major hurdle, the alarm system. The next challenge was the vault room's walls, which were made of reinforced concrete with a thickness of 50 centimeters. They realized that drilling through these walls would take an impractically long time, possibly days, which was not a viable option. So they decided to use dynamite to blast through the walls. However, another problem arose. The sound of the explosion could attract attention. They came up with a solution to execute their plan on Memorial Day. Festivals, gatherings, and fireworks mark this day, making a lot of noise and commotion. They reasoned that even if anyone heard the explosion of the dynamite they planned to use on the bank's vault, they would likely consider it the sound of fireworks and festivities, not suspecting anything unusual. On the night of Memorial Day, which coincided with a long weekend, meaning the bank would be closed for three consecutive days, the gang set their plan into motion. The noisy festivities and the bank's extended closure provided the perfect cover, allowing them ample time to operate undetected. Four members of the gang, Gerald, the corrupt first officer, and the mastermind. Joe, the other corrupt officer, Francis, the gangster, and Bucky, the professional thief responsible for disabling the alarm, were to execute the break-in and robbery. While the fifth member, Tommy, Gerald's close associate, had a crucial role. He patrolled around the bank in a police car, monitoring the area to protect his accomplices from any external intervention, whether from other police or civilians. Tommy was not just any regular officer. He held a high rank and was the highest ranking officer on duty that night. This position enabled him to easily redirect other officers away from the bank. Gerald and his three accomplices, confident that their operation would not be interrupted, commenced the heist. Their first step was to disable the bank's alarm, which Bucky quickly did using his specially designed electronic device to block the alarm signal. The next step was to breach the bank. However, instead of breaking directly into the bank, they entered a neighboring shop. This shop had less secure doors compared to the fortified doors of the bank. After breaking into the shop, they moved up to the attic. Only a wall separated the shop from the bank, which was located in the same building. Upon reaching the attic, they found the wall separating them from the space above the bank's vault room. This wall was much weaker and easier to break through. They easily broke through this wall, creating an opening that allowed them access to the area above the bank's vault. Now, the gang found themselves in the space directly above the bank's vault room. This area was filled with various installations and pipes and had the bank's vault ceiling just beneath their feet. As mentioned before, this ceiling was made of extremely thick reinforced concrete, about 50 centimeters deep. This was the ceiling they needed to blast through to enter the vault. The first step was to drill holes into this concrete ceiling to insert the dynamite sticks. Throughout this operation, Tommy, who was patrolling outside in the police car, maintained constant radio communication with the team inside. Before making any loud noises or causing any disturbances, they needed Tommy's confirmation that the area was clear. If someone passed by while they were drilling, the noise could draw unwanted attention and cause problems. As the four inside were drilling into the vault ceiling, Tommy suddenly radioed them to stop immediately. They ceased drilling as Tommy spotted two individuals approaching the area. These individuals were, in fact, shop owners who had a store opposite the bank. Despite most shops being closed, these two had come to organize some items in their shop. Tommy quickly approached the shop owners and informed them that criminal activities were happening in the area and that it was currently unsafe. He urged them to leave. The shop owners didn't suspect anything amiss 
On the contrary, they were pleased with the police's prompt response and commitment to upholding security. They heeded Tommy's advice and left without further questions. Tommy then signaled his accomplices inside to resume their work. The gang continued drilling holes in the vaulted ceiling, and once finished, they placed the dynamite sticks into these holes, preparing the site for an explosion. However, they were well aware of the risks involved in detonating explosives in the middle of the city. The sound of the blast could potentially be heard. To minimize this risk, they brought along sandbags and placed them over the dynamite. These sandbags served two purposes. Firstly, to muffle or at least reduce the sound of the explosion. And secondly, to direct the force of the explosion downwards towards the vault ceiling. Once everything was ready, the four men retreated to the adjacent shop and remotely detonated the dynamite. The explosion was significant, and its sound was audible from a distance. Tommy even heard it, indicating that residents in the area likely heard it too. However, no reports were made because, as they had anticipated, anyone who heard the explosion would probably assume it was part of the ongoing fireworks and celebrations. The explosion created a large hole in the vault ceiling, but there were still iron bars left intact. The explosion hadn't been able to break all of them. However, the gang was prepared for this and had brought a welding torch, which they used to cut through the bars. The process was time-consuming, but eventually they managed to cut through the iron and descend into the vault room. As mentioned earlier, the vault room contained an inner safe where the bank stored its money, as well as safety deposit boxes rented out to bank customers for storing their valuables. The thieves split their tasks. Two of them worked on opening the inner safe with welding torches, while the other two focused on breaking the locks of the safety deposit boxes. Their primary target was the inner safe, which they expected to be full of cash. Breaking into the inner safe with a welding torch took over an hour, but when they finally opened it, they were shocked to find that it contained only $60,000. The reason for this was that the bank's employees had sent the money to the Federal Reserve, as it was the end of the week and coincided with Memorial Day. The bank would be closed for three nights, and it was standard practice not to leave large sums in the vault over such a period. Ironically, the very reason they chose this day for the heist was what led to the vault being nearly empty. After months of planning and hard work, the gang was left frustrated and agitated with only $60,000, far less than the life-changing sum they had hoped for. To salvage their operation, the gang decided to redirect their focus to the safety deposit boxes. Initially, they hadn't expected these boxes to contain significant loot, but it was their only remaining option. However, as night turned to dawn, they decided to stop their activities and return home. They still had two nights left, as the bank would remain closed for the holiday, giving them time to return and continue their work. Despite the risks, being police officers and having one of their own on the lookout provided them with some reassurance. If they were ordinary thieves, they likely wouldn't have dared to return. They came back the following night, re-entering the vault to concentrate on breaking into and looting the safety deposit boxes. Surprisingly, these boxes contained far more cash and jewels than they had anticipated. However, their focus on the safety deposit boxes paid off. They didn't manage to break all the boxes in one night, so they returned the next night to continue. Eventually, they found approximately $2 million in cash and about $8 million worth of jewels and gold, totaling nearly $10 million. This was the lifetime haul they had hoped for, eliminating the need for any future heists. Their first action was to divide the cash among themselves, with each member receiving $400,000. The real challenge for the gang was how to fairly distribute the jewelry among themselves. After some discussion, they decided to convert the jewelry into cash instead of trying to divide it, as they couldn't ascertain its exact value. They planned to sell it on the black market to a criminal organization or gang at a price lower than the market value, which would then handle the jewels. This meant they wouldn't divide the jewelry immediately. Gerald, as the leader, decided to leave the jewelry with Joe Bang, the third corrupt officer, as he had a secure place to hide it. 
Gerald then advised the gang members to hide their money and refrain from any reckless behavior in the coming period, as police investigations were imminent once the heist was discovered. Given the scale of the theft, the FBI was expected to get involved. Each member took their share of the cash, and Joe Bangs took his share along with the jewelry. They all returned to their homes to wait and see what would unfold the next day. The following morning, bank employees returning after the holiday were shocked to find the vault ransacked, safety deposit boxes opened, and a hole in the ceiling. As expected, the FBI arrived to investigate the crime scene, with local police officers, including Tommy Dorsey, one of the robbers, assisting them. Tommy spied on the investigators, ensuring no leads or evidence could tie them to the crime. They had been very careful, leaving no fingerprints or traces behind. The FBI's initial suspicions were that the perpetrators were locals with knowledge of the place and some level of authority, possibly bank employees, security staff, or even police officers. They were aware of corruption within the local police force and had their eyes on certain officers, including Gerald and Tommy, who were high-ranking officers on duty that night. Gerald knew they might be suspected, but he was confident that he and his gang had left no evidence. When questioned by the FBI about his whereabouts on the night of the heist, Gerald claimed he was with his secret mistress, as mentioned earlier in our story. He opted for this alibi instead of saying he was at home with his wife and children, as they might inadvertently contradict his story. Gerald decided that the safest option was to claim he had been with his secret mistress, Barbara Hickey, on the night of the heist. Indeed, after the operation that night, he did visit her. While admitting to having a mistress exposed Gerald personally, it provided him with an alibi that the investigators, whose primary concern was the heist, however, Gerald had previously instructed Barbara to corroborate his story if questioned, thereby providing him with an alibi and a witness to vouch for his whereabouts. True to the plan, when the FBI investigators brought in Barbara, she confirmed that Gerald had been with her throughout that night. The FBI continued their investigation, questioning other police officers, some bank employees, and even the owners of nearby shops. Despite these extensive inquiries, they couldn't reach a conclusive result. There was no evidence or lead pointing to the perpetrators, leaving Gerald and his accomplice, Tommy, feeling relatively secure as they monitored the investigation's progress from within. Everything indicated that the FBI was unlikely to find anything incriminating them, so all they had to do was stay calm until the case cooled down, potentially closing within a year. Indeed, months passed, almost a year, and the case remained quiet without any significant progress by the FBI. It seemed that the case might soon be considered cold and the investigation suspended. While Gerald managed to stay calm and hidden, the problem lay with his accomplices, Tommy and Joe. Tommy and Joe were anything but calm following the heist. On the contrary, they started spending their money recklessly on women and cocaine, living in a constant state of exhilaration and seeking pleasure in every possible way. As mentioned earlier, Gerald had entrusted the stolen jewelry to Joe, planning to convert it into cash once the investigation cooled down. However, Joe started misusing some of the jewelry, even gifting pieces to a woman he was trying to impress and selling others. This news reached Tommy, and given that both were not in their best mental states, often under the influence of cocaine and other drugs, the situation escalated quickly. When Tommy learned about Joe's actions with the jewelry, he confronted him. Their argument turned violent, and in the heat of the moment, Tommy, who had a rifle, shot Joe unexpectedly. The police arrived and arrested Tommy, turning the whole situation upside down. The fact that Joe survived the gunshot made the problem worse. Since the incident involved police officers, higher authorities were called in for an investigation. The state police, who rank above the local city police, took over the case. During their investigation of the incident, the state police searched the scene, including the cars of both the perpetrator and the victim. When they opened the trunk of Joe's car, they found a bag containing a portion of the stolen jewelry and a kilo of cocaine. 
This discovery dramatically changed the course of the investigation and the aftermath of the bank heist. When Gerald heard the news about Tommy and Joe's situation, he realized he was in deep trouble. Two of his accomplices were involved in an investigation, and to make matters worse, the police had found part of the stolen jewelry. The situation had drastically changed for him, from waiting for the case to cool down to it escalating due to his partner's recklessness. He felt there was no option but to stay put and hope that none of his partners would turn on him. After all, they had no reason to implicate him, even if they had entangled themselves. A few weeks later, Tommy's trial for shooting Joe commenced, with Joe present in court. During the trial, Joe was brought to the witness stand to testify about the shooting. Tommy's lawyer, focusing on the bag of drugs and stolen jewelry found in Joe's car trunk, argued that Joe's testimony couldn't be reliable as he was a drug user and thief. However, Joe's response to these questions was shocking. He admitted his drug use and involvement in the depositor's trust bank heist on Memorial Day, implicating Tommy as his accomplice. This revelation astounded the courtroom. After the trial, Tommy was found guilty of the shooting. More importantly, the FBI started investigating Joe, who agreed to a deal to provide all details about the heist in exchange for immunity. Although Joe's testimony was weak due to his compromised credibility, it pointed the FBI in the right direction. The investigators began scrutinizing Gerald's personal life and discovered he had left his secret mistress, Barbara. They interviewed her again, and under assurances of protection, she confessed that Gerald had returned on the night of the heist covered in dust, including cement dust. This information was the breakthrough the investigators needed. Following this lead, they arrested Gerald at his home for the bank robbery. Gerald was nervous but kept convincing himself that he had left no evidence behind and could ultimately clear his name in court with the right lawyer. The real shock for Gerald came when his former mistress, Barbara, took the stand as a witness in court. She didn't just testify about the night he returned covered in dust late at night. She also spoke about his behavior and character, portraying him as a corrupt officer. She revealed that Gerald often talked about a big operation that would change his life forever. Sitting in the courtroom, Gerald knew this was the end for him. He wasn't the only one on trial. Tommy, who had shot Joe and sparked this whole debacle, was also being judge. Alongside them were Francis, the gangster, and Bucky, the professional thief responsible for disabling the alarm system. But Joe, the third corrupt officer who had been their accomplice, turned against them in court. Having struck a deal with the FBI, he was granted immunity in exchange for his confession and testimony against his former partners. Gerald and his co-defendants were sentenced to 30 to 40 years in prison. They were facing the grim prospect of either dying in prison or being released in their twilight years. Their lives were irrevocably changed by the choices they had made. And here we come to the end of this story. Hope you enjoyed it. If you aren't already subscribed to the channel, please subscribe and activate the notification bell. Also, check out some of our amazing previous stories that you can watch. See you in the next video.